Thank you. <coughs> Photography became a passion for Victorians. The scientific process was very long and expensive and uh, used much heavy equipment. Fox Talbot produced a calotype, which is a positive print from a, um, paper, but the first one was a, a daguerreotype, which was on polished metal. This is the first universal image for the masses, and it is called an ambrotype. And it is a glass negative in a fancy case. It remained popular until the 1880s. And it looks expensive, but it was made of very cheap material. So a pretend leather case, a bit of velvet, and um, a bit of brass. But it had one big disadvantage. You could not put your name on it, so the studios couldn't advertise with it. Photography really took off after 1854. André Adolf Desdairy patented a method so several portraits could be taken on the same piece of paper on a single plate. The result was a small photo card known as a carte de viste. All the details of the studios were printed on the back of these cards. At first, they were in small letters, eventually becoming beautifully designed graphics. A larger photo card, called the cabinet card, was introduced in 1866, measuring four by five. You can see there, there's the larger ones and the smaller ones. And the cabinet card had greater appeal to the middle classes because it was slightly more expensive and looked a bit posher. But um, by the 1860s, photography studios were everywhere, often as part of another business. Anyone could be immortalised for posterity. It became a mark of respectability. You put on your best clothes and visited the studio, where you were photographed against a painted room setting with furniture and props so these are two totally different photographs from the same studio, and you can see the background setting is identical. So even if you were quite poor, you could pretend you were one of the middle classes by having a nice image taken. Um, I know an antique dealer, and a few weeks ago, he had on his stall a camera. He had on an original camera of a glass plate box camera from the 1860s. Now these... I looked at it and I said, oh, God, please, I've got to photograph this. And um, it's quite large. You can't tell how big it is. It's about that big. And it would have been on a tripod. So these were the kind of plate glass cameras that were used in studios. There was also another camera, a handheld camera, that was uh, invented and in the 1860s with a spring shutter that um, was released by a trigger and that's where the expression snapshot comes from. Now that one, if you look at the bottom there, sorry, you look at the bottom, you'll see that I think is the spring shot camera, but it's still quite large. I and mean, both of them are very big to have to carry around. And uh, often they had vans and they were putting all their equipment on vans if they were moving around. By the 1860s, photography studios were opening everywhere, often as part of another business. Anyone could be immortalised for posterity. Now, the darkly comic song by George Grossmith dates from 1870. And it tells the harrowing tale of a young woman who kills herself by swallowing the photographer's chemicals because she wants a photographer to notice her. <laughs> it was written by George Grossmith, who worked with Gilbert and Sullivan and also wrote Diary of a Nobody. And it was sung with a banjo accompaniment, even though it's very sad. <laughs> Stoke Newington in the 1860s was still a mainly middle-class area with a rural village feel. The railway and trams had not arrived, but it was full of small traders. Everything you could possibly get was um, available on the high street and surrounding areas. Church Street became a hub for photography over the years, and one of the first ones was Frederick Forster. Then Arthur Forster was at 76 Church Street in the 70s, describing himself also as a miniature painter, they could reproduce the photographs and paint them in colour. So you could put them in a locket or put them, you know, make a decorative present of them. Um, there was also William Jewett at number 29 in 1771. But I want to talk about one of the earliest studios 
who opened up, possibly the first one, which is Augustus Lupson. Now, the Lupson family, I discovered a very interesting story, and it's about Augustus and his son. And he, Augustus, opened a studio at number six Church Street. Lupson was born in Cambridge in 1829, but he lived with his parents in Stoke Newington. His mother, Susanna, was from Hackney, and his father, Thomas, was a printer, that he was a hairdresser and a perfumier in the 1851 census. Now, many small businesses started out with another trade, and some of them went into photography, and hairdressing became a very popular uh, profession to go into photography, because, of course, um, you could uh, photograph and take the lady's hair at the same time. Um, so we have here three Lapsen carts, um, carte de vistes. As you can see, advertising changed over the years. And that one, I think, they're all 1860s, as you can see. And if you look at the lady's hair, you'll see she's got quite an elaborate little knot at the top of her head. So I think she probably had her hair done. And you've got Lapsen with three different cards here. The, the advertising changed a lot, and in all the early photographers from the 1860s, in the beginning, you will see they were very plain, but they got more and more elaborate as time went on. In 1853, when Lapson was 24, he married Elizabeth Chamberlain in Hackney. But tragedy hit the family. Three of their children died under five years old. Wallace in 1865, Ernest aged three in 67, and Augustus, less than a year old, in 67. The children are buried in Abney Park, where later their mother joined them. The Lapsons had three other children who lived, Charles, Frederick, and Emily. Frederick Thomas, his son, was born in Hackney in 1856 and also became a photographer, first assisting his father at number six, Church Street. So you can see that back of that sign there with... Lapson and Son on it. He opened his own studio at 9 Church Street in 1879, the home of his grandparents, who had died a few years before. So we don't know if they actually had the house, and the house was left to Augustus and his son. I haven't looked at the will yet. Um, but So he opened it in 79, but 1878 had been a terrible year for Augustus and for his son, Frederick. First of all, his mother died in April in her 40s. But in March of that year, Frederick was sued for breach of promise by Annie Rees. Now, breach of promise meant if you promised to marry somebody and you didn't go through with it, you broke that promise and you could be sued if the victim had spent a lot of money preparing for that wedding. So it suddenly became a contract. But it wasn't a contract if you just said, hey, I'm going to marry you, and there was no financial involvement in engaged with this. And it was one of the few ways in the law that women actually got something back, because the rest of the law was not very well designed for them. Anyway, um, so what happened was the year before, in 1877, the parties had met at Margate and agreed to marry in January of the following year. Annie claimed to have spent £60 on wedding clothes. £60. Now, that is more than a year's wages for the average working man in 1860s. And uh, I doubt very much that she spent that much. It would have been ridiculous, unless she was absolutely loaded. Um, however, um, she admitted that her pocket was hurt more than her feelings. And the judge believed her, uh, and her financial outlay, you know, he decided, yes, she has to be rewarded. So she was given 80 pounds. So poor Fred and his dad, Augustus, were suddenly 80 pounds out of pocket due to this. Um, however, Fred didn't uh, suffer very long in terms of uh, romance, because he, he married again. He married an Elizabeth Alice Atkins at St. Leonard's-on-Sea, in August 1888. Now, 
In the 81 census, they're still running their photography business at number nine, Church Street. But Fred left Church Street in 1884. His life in Stoke Newington was over. He moved to Coventry and set up a studio at Hartford Street, which was successful for a few years. For four years, Fred was in Coventry, and he obviously took his photography very seriously. But then there was a fire in the studio, and he moved the business to Newark in Nottingham, becoming the assistant photographer to H.J. Bliss. He had three children, a boy, Harry, and two girls, Dorothy and Marjorie. Tragedy struck with the death of Harry in Newark in 1898, aged 17 of heart disease, according to the inquest. I think the death must have traumatised the family and, and destroyed Fred, because after that, in 1899, they emigrated to South Africa, and Fred enlisted in the Suffolk Regiment to fight the Boer War. He was in his 40s, but he participated in their battles, gaining medals, and I wonder whether his skill as a photographer was used to photograph the war, because they would have had a lot of photographers photographing both the First World War, the Boer War, and even in the Crimea, they had photographers. Um, the Suffolk Regiment in action, that's a photograph of them. So Fred died in South Africa in 1930, and his family were well established there. Meanwhile, back in England, his father, Augustus Lupson, had wasted no time in marrying again after the death of his wife, Elizabeth. At the beginning of 1879, he married Phoebe Dixie Gray, the 42-year-old daughter of a florist. Augustus Lupson left Six Church Street in 1877 after 13 years to set up in 82 Albion Road, leaving in 1881, then on the electoral roll at 9 Camden Street before returning to 34 Upper Street for six years, 87 to 92. But that building, yes, uh, who knows what that is? Yeah. In 96, he was admitted to the Hoban Workhouse for a time. His business started to fail. There was a lot of competition by now. His wife died in 1899. In the 1901 census, he's in the Islington Workhouse, St. John's Road, that's it there. And he's described as not able-bodied and a hairdresser, so his photography is not mentioned. He may have had arthritis or some illness which prevented him from using his hands. Um, he wasn't a... I think it was something like arthritis because he actually died in the workhouse aged 83. And there's his discharge. His discharge is dead. <laughs> um, so from a successful photo pioneering photography business, he ended up penniless and buried by the parish in a common grave, his photography business forgotten. Al Alfred Henry Vernon was born in the city road Shoreditch in 1840. His first studio was at 146 Stoke Newington Road from 1871 to 1877. Then moving to 417 Kingsland Road from 1882 to 1891. He died in Tottenham in 93. But this photo shows the decorated backs of Vernon and of Lupson. So you can see that Vernon has coloured his back pink, this photograph of a man. And then Lupson produced his decor most decorated card and coloured it green. So it would be in the 1870s. And also, again, the very elaborate hairstyle, I think, was done by Lupson in his hairdressing. So those cards were reproduced in the 1860s. And um, I think, I don't know whether who did the colour one first, whether it was Foster or Lapson trying to keep in <laughs> with each other. After Vernon left, Edgar Salomon occupied 146 Stoke Newington Road in the longest occupancy of any studio from 1891 to 1933. He set it up when he was 19. His father, Jacob, was a wealthy boot and shoe manufacturer born in Prussia. So Edgar, a younger son, had plenty of money behind him. He also had a studio at St Paul's from 1901 to 1909. In the 1901 census, he's living at Adolphus Road. Very nice houses there. He's unmarried, a photographic artist with his widowed mother and a couple of unmarried brothers. His mother, the matriarch of the family, is living on her own means, shorthand for a good income. 
So we see Luxon probably started his business with not very much, but Solomon had all the advantages of being a wealthy younger son. That's another Salomon portrait. Very pretty girl. Now, going back to Fred, Fred left his studio, number nine Church Street, in 1884 to go to Coventry, and Alfred Lawson Adkins took it for his son, Alfred Jewell. But it only lasted for 84 to 88. Again, it's another wealthy man running a studio. Atkins was born in Coventry in 1826 and was a successful linen draper. His early life spent in Walworth and Islington, where his son, Alfred Jewell, was born in 1863. In the 81 census, he is living in Stockbridge Terrace, Belgravia, with his wife, employing one man and three women. Alfred Lawson was, Law, was obviously interested in photography, as he was a member of the Camera Club, a club for wealthy amateurs founded in 1885 under the presidency of Captain W. W. Abney. No connection. Um, the Camera Club, I think, is still going. So again, it was a, a club where you had to have a lot of money to buy this very expensive equipment. By 1891, Adkins and his son are back in North London, living at 46 Stamford Hill, described as photographers in the census. Then we had Ernest Pierce. Ernest Pierce had 76 Church Street from 1890-93, then moved to the Adkins studio at 46 Stamford Hill. So you see a lot of these studios are going through different photographers. I, I imagine it's because they're already equipped, so it was much easier to pass them on to another photographer when you'd finished than to, for them to be anything else. And what's nice about this is this very decorated back of Pierce's the 1870s. Again, some of these backs are real works of art when you're looking at them. Another very successful company were the Johnsons. Henry Eugene Johnson, born in Bedford in 1853, died in 1937, was running two studios and advertising regularly in local papers. He was at 60 High Street from 1886 to 1900 and 103 Seven Sisters Road from 1887 to 95. After Johnson left 60 High Street, the Wallace brothers took over the studio. So there's two Johnson cards there, cabinet cards. And that's some of his advertising in the local paper. Another, <clears throat> I'm going to end with one of the most interesting after Lapson's people, which is Leah Latimer Christmas, who was born in Northampton in 1871, the son of a coach builder, Eliza Christmas who was a Londoner, but his first children were born in Watford. By 1881, Eliza had become a lodging house keeper. In the 91 census, Leah Latimer is living with his parents in Bromley and is listed as a photographer. He's only 20 years old and must have developed a very early interest. In 1895, he marries Edith George at Limehouse. In 1897, he sets up his first studio at 104 Stoke Newington Road, this was a very shrewd move on his part, as his studio was opposite the newly opened Alexandria Theatre, designed by the great theatre architect Frank Matcham. That is the Alexandria Palace Theatre. And it's described in the era as North London will shortly be in possession of a fine, com commodious theatre of which it may, with good reason, be proud. It will provide seating accommodation for 3,000 people, and everyone will have an uninterrupted view of the stage. It wasn't quite 3,000, it was more like 2,200, but never mind. It's advertising. Big time entertainment had arrived in Stoke Newington. So the first production opened on Boxing Day, 97, and was a prestigious Drury Lane pantomime at Whittington. Leah Latimer smartly used the proximity to the theatre in his advertising. He also advertised again in the Hackney and Kingsland Gazette. It will be interesting to find out if any of these later photographers actually took any photos of any of the actors, because there are many studio actors going into studios still getting their photos taken, but that needs a bit more research. Look into that. Um, Leah stayed at 104 Stoke Newington Road, but moved to Watford after 1910 and then to St Albans. Leah took photographs of soldiers training during the First World War, as did his brother Walter Henry Christmas. 
By the early 20th century, there were more studios than ever, but photography for the masses had become by the masses with the introduction of the affordable, handheld, lightweight box brownie by Eastman Kodak. It was sort of made of cardboard, and it was very light. So that was introduced around about 1900. So no more standing stiffly in a fake room or just a hobby for the wealthy. With the introduction of the cinema, we all became obsessed with our image. Thanks to those early pioneers, we can see our ancestors and photograph. Photography is now part of all our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.